Hi all, I have another absolutely fascinating encounter to show you. Leela ID 61068, so one of the very latest networks against the official Stockfish 10. There have been uh, developments in Stockfish. The development versions are apparently significantly stronger. The time limit here is three, three minutes each with a two second increment. And the opening start position after E4, E5, you might want to use this yourself, knight f3, knight c6, this move knight c3. It sets actually a little trap for your opponent already if they play the natural looking bishop c5, as I have myself in some games. It fails a little bit to knight takes e5, white's guaranteed at least a small advantage. Uh, for example like this, if the bishop drops back there, white's doing very nicely here. And even better, if black reacts with bishop takes f2 instead, then you could look forward to a clear advantage actually, because uh, the king is only slightly inconvenienced. You can play like this to stop the use of the g4 square and get a really nice position with a clear advantage, for example, like this, manually castling. So it's a nice system, knight c3, just to provoke bishop c5, but say knight f6, and you can shock your opponent now with the Halloween gambit. So knight takes e5, sacrificing a whole knight. Here is the end of the book. And let's test it with these remarkable engines. So Leela plays d4, knight g6, e5. So Leela playing white, knight g8, bishop c4. So targeting the f7 soft spot. Here, Stockfish 10 elects for d6. We have queen f3. F6. This has been seen before in some high level over the board games. In this position, h4. So looking to maybe install a form pawn. We have c6. In one over the board game, there has been with uh, d takes e5 was seen. Uh, that was in Guzman, who was rated 2355 against Larson 2458 in an IECG email correspondence game. And that ended up uh, as a win for White actually, just to quickly show you that, that quite aggressive play from White. And going for that h6, that form pawn. And it was you know quite an interesting game actually. So you can see quite exciting just to flick through this. So I got a good position from here and managed to eventually convert it in this end game. So there is a backdrop uh, over the board game here. So that backdrop, yes, that is with the move D takes E5 in this position. Uh, but here we see C6, Stockfish playing C6. We have h5. Now knight takes e5. Here d takes d5. And you might expect here for white just to drop the bishop back. And uh, hand white basically, uh, sorry, hand black basically uh, a small edge. Because on bishop b3, f takes e5. Black's got that nice central control which as beginners we're, we're told the four central squares of key importance, nice duo of pawns. And black's um, going to be improving the position uh, quite easily after that. But there's a shock here, a shocking move was played in this position. Can you guess what Leela played? So 61068 played something else instead here. If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, yeah, just sacked a piece, sacked a whole bishop, bishop f4. We have d takes, rook d1, and it's very, very different uh, climate to the position. Uh, so black hasn't got central pawn duo. White seems to be controlling the key central uh, squares or putting more pressure on them immediately. Uh, but it is at the cost of a piece. Is the center worth it like this? We have also, though, another feature, a form pawn, h6 because that's actually left. So we have yeah, some interesting compensation going on, not just the center of the form pawn. What more can you want? <laughs> if g takes h6, then the king in the center is going to be very vulnerable. And in fact, we have a loose piece liability here as well. 
So for example, like this, bang, it goes the queen after e takes f6. And we can win the queen. It's a very, very dangerous position, basically, uh, after this, g takes after queen h5. <laughs> um, so g6, white just casually castles. So one thing about this form pawn here, this is a loose rook, which is harder to sort of untangle. We have the move f5. On f takes e, just to show some of the pitfalls for black, rook f e1, bishop e7. Rook takes e5 with tempo, knight e4, this position, and looking at that rook with queen c3 is very, very dangerous. This is a very, very dangerous scenario. You know, it's going to be winning material anyway. The, even more significant, the king in the center is just nightmare. So uh, black played f5. We have now e6. So this opens up this diagonal a bit more. We have knight f6. On bishop takes e6, as you might expect, this leads to a bit of trouble with rook takes e6 here, check, queen takes c4, check, queen d4, just looking at that rook actually, uh, will guarantee white a nice advantage. And the pawn is only two steps away from queening as well, that form pawn. So we have knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7, rook fe1, black castles. And now this is... A superbly interesting concept to me what happened here why it happened uh, the kind of uh, factors involved in this uh, white plays the move Queen f4 uh, positionally first of all this is a blockade it stamps on the possibility it stops the legal possibility of f4 which might be useful to black in certain circumstances it also eyes the pawn, so it's not just a blockading move, it's eyeing the c4 pawn to grab that. And also it makes way for a certain key knight maneuver as well, uh, potentially, with still pressure on f5, which uh, is going to be happening soon. Now if knight e2 happens immediately, just to show, f4 is actually a decent move here. It liberates the queen, hits the bishop immediately. Uh, so that runs into knight h5 double attack on the queen from the rook and the knight and that's a tactical disaster so queen f4 really keeps a grip on the position and you know seems to threaten the pawn uh, just to look at this again so f4 is is just horrible uh, if knight takes f4 then just queen takes g5 so a very very nice positional move the calm before the storm move just a simple blockade of one pawn and hitting another it encourages black to play b5 and far from liberating the queen now the queen is kind of blocked a little bit more across this diagonal um, not diagonal <laughs> across this rank so here b5 if knight e4 then white can just take on e7 if knight d5 uh, which uh, you might think does something just taking here and this position queen e5 with that form pawn threatens checkmate. That's a big advantage for white. There's there's nothing really uh, significant about this. A6, white can just take on C4. So black reacts with this B5. It seems, you know, logical, protect the pawn. We have this move 92. So this is very, very interesting uh, with the idea of knight D4 and trying to undermine this pawn chain. Also, of course, a knight going to D4 hits this side of the board as well. So very interesting, knight E2. We have queen B6. If bishop takes e6, then queen e5 is strong here. And you'll note that's useful that the queen's not looking on that rank. And then taking here, white's getting a small edge. So knight e2, queen b6 was played, knight d4. Knight d5, a really interesting position indeed here. If um, c5, in fact, white might be tempted for knight takes f5 here and queen g3 with menacing ideas revolving around the form pawn. And even if knight h5, you might think that's a tactical nuisance. Queen h4 is actually strong here. It's this central pawn here which is also helping white's attack. Um, yeah, white's got uh, good play there. Uh, if knight h5 uh, here, just look at this scenario. Knight takes f5, knight e7 check. White can actually um, 
it turns out this isn't completely crushing in all but one variation. This scenario after queen e5 uh, would be crushing if it wasn't for knight f4, uh, which gives black a breathing space. If knight f6, for example, then check and white smashes through with, yeah, this really nice knight takes d5 for a discovered attack on the king. And in this scenario, uh, the queen's been won and then the rook's been won. So the disaster for black. So yeah, there's interesting stuff happening in this knight h5 line. Uh, so yeah, really interesting stuff with knight takes f5 there and knight e7 there. But yeah, because of this one resource knight f4, if queen takes f4, black gets a breathing space for a tempo gain, rook f8. And it seems as though white only has a perpetual check scenario, for example, like this, uh, leading to an even position. So knight h5, yeah, it does seem plausible. But knight d5, um, sorry, after knight d4, knight d5 was played instead, this way of attacking the queen. We have now uh, a different uh, resource being used. Queen e5, threatening checkmate. Knight f6 is played. Going back, yeah, it seems a bit of a time waste. If bishop f6, bishop takes, knight takes. e7 is strong, yeah, undermining the knight if the rook moves. If bishop d7, uh, just take the rook and play knight e6. This is massive after that crashing through. Uh, so that's horrible. Uh, in this position, if rook e8, we just take that knight and then uh, we're going to be mating on g7. So uh, it's very, very dangerous. The knight just retracted to f6. But here now, guess what white plays here? If I give you five seconds. Okay, it's it looks like a really juicy position, actually, doesn't it? Dynamically, with that pawn in the center, the queen nicely in the center. That central control, you know, the peace sacrifice earlier leading to this is just wonderful chess to me. Wonderful dynamic attacking chess. Um, we have knight takes f5, a culmination, a celebration of the position. Uh, g takes, queen g3. <clears throat> With the huge threat of bishop f6 check. We have king h8. If knight h5 now, queen h5 here is very strong. For example, knight f6, and the key move here, gaining a tempo, is vicious. Bishop e3, gaining a key tempo, and still threatening queen g5, queen g7, because the king's got no escape because of that pawn. So this would be winning the queen. Uh, so uh, we have king h8, and now bishop takes f6, e7, and although white's a piece down, not for too long, rook d6. The bishop is has, having to stand guard over g7. Uh, also, rook d8 is super strong here, as well as it's it's just a winning position right now. There's a different road to roam here with rook d8. For example, this position, white's uh, winning there. Very difficult for black to do anything. But rook d6, very strong as well, bishop d4. And now we have king f1. This is a necessary uh, precaution, king f1. Another quiet before the storm. If c3, then bishop takes, queen takes, bishop b7 should only be uh, about even this position technically. So it's important that there's no possibility of bishop f2 swapping off the queens. With this simple move, it means it sets an if then condition to stop fish. If you take care, I'm going to just checkmate you with queen g7. A very important if then condition inserted by this quiet move king f1. So if bishop e6, well bishop e6 was played instead of bishop f2. If bishop f2, just to put that on the board, queen g7 checkmate. Uh, so bishop e6 is a desperate looking move. Rook d takes e6, queen b8. Rook d6 hitting the bishop, trying to nudge it away from g7. Queen c7. Yeah, if bishop takes b2, we can just snub out that bishop with the move c3, threatening queen g7. On rook takes, we're just absolutely winning. It's crushing, isn't it? With rook g6, h7, checkmate. So um, queen c7, snapping off this bishop, and lo and behold, 
Well, it's in a winning end game now. <laughs> After all that, <laughs> Queen takes, F takes the in. There's an interest dividend on all the investments paid off thus far, and White's gaining actually uh, a fantastic end game position. So let's see what happens here. So White's uh, in the driving seat in this end game. Material up, two pawns up. Okay, one pawn up now, but this is dominating. These two connected pass pawns over here uh, are absolutely crushing. We have rook e2 check. It seems far too dangerous to allow rook a7 and king f6 if rook g5. So uh, two connected pass pawns. The, the king's coming in anyway with the rook on the seven franc. Capablanca would approve. Rook c7. And here the game was adjudicated as a win for white. Both engines fought is absolutely uh, winning here. Okay, we can, for example, just snap off on c6, work on these pawns moving forward. So I thought that was a really interesting dynamic interpretation of what might be quite a serious gambit the Halloween gambit actually the way it was played in this game seems to have a plausibility about it if you were to play it in your own games if players were black um, just played you know d6 and f6 it does look awkward but this whole plan of the h pawn the form pawn uh, really comes alive and it's funny the over the board stem game also sporting this idea of the form pawn the h pawn as a killer pawn really dynamic potential white not accepting this situation where black had early central control and occupation in the center instead white sacked an entire piece and the central control implication later you know white's the one occupying the center with pieces with great attacking pressure on the king side so huge dynamic decisions made early on from that peace sacrifice. I found it really fascinating. I hope you did as well. And you might try this Halloween Gambit because it sets that little trap as well on Bishop C5 early in the opening. So it seems to be quite an interesting uh, opening with quite a bit of bite for the one E4 player. If you want to know both sides actually, uh, resources on both sides, check out this Surviving the Halloween Gambit course at Kings Crusher TV slash Halloween it's got trainable variations and so we're seeing resources for both sides plans for both sides it creates a, a nice understanding a balanced understanding I believe if you check the wins for both white and black to see what resources and uh, counter resources are available okay thanks very much